Okay. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> um, everybody calls me Henny. My official name is actually Henya. And uh, that name I received when I was 13 years old. Uh, because before that, during the Holocaust, all documents were lost or destroyed. So I didn't really have a proper ID. But I just wanted to tell you that uh, on the Jewish calendar, today is a holiday. It's called Purim, which is the Persian word for lots because this evil man by the name of Haman uh, drew lots to figure out which day they're going to destroy all the Jews of the Persian Empire. And it happened to fall on the 14th of Adar on the Jewish calendar, which is today. And some of you might know that uh, it's traditional to uh, read the scroll of the book of Esther on Purim, which tells the story of how uh, the Jews of Persia were going to be destroyed, and then they were saved. And that's really the basis of Jewish history. Every generation and every part of history, somebody tried to destroy us. We survived, let's eat. So we celebrate by eating these pastries called homentashen. It's like a triangular Danish with some nice filling. But if you go to a service, which is pretty short, you read the story of uh, the Scroll of Esther, and every time Haman's name is mentioned, everybody uses a gragger, a noisemaker, to drown him out. And in Eastern Europe, if people didn't have a gragger, they'd put Haman's name on the bottom of the shoe and stomp him out. So, uh, you know, if you learned any history, you know that people always look for someone else, right, to blame, some scapegoat, uh, whether it's their religion or the color of their skin. And so, uh, Jews who have always been a minority all over the world were a very convenient scapegoat. So whether it was the Babylonians who destroyed the first temple or the Persians or the Romans who destroyed the second temple and took everybody into exile, uh, this history has repeated itself and that brings us to the latest, and that was the Nazis, who decided that everything should be blamed on the Jews. If the economy is bad, it must be the Jews who caused it. It had nothing to do with it, as you must have learned, but it was a way to blame the Jews. And besides, you know, Jews, don't observe the same religion as everybody around them, so they must be horrible, maybe not even human. So, uh, you know, attach all kinds of horrible things to them, and then it would be okay to blame them, take away their properties, take away their belongings, kick them out, or even kill them. So, uh, after the exp expulsion from Spain in a very famous year, 1492, by Isabel and uh, Ferdinand, uh, Jews had a choice, either convert to Christianity or uh, leave the country and if they were caught practicing Judaism in secret, they were burned at the stake. So Jews wandered into other countries all the way up to Northern Europe. And my ancestors came to Lithuania 
in the 1600s. So I'm uh, going to show you how uh, the Germans in the 1930s when Hitler came to power uh, worked his way all the way from Poland up to um, Lithuania. Now the map in front of you, you can probably see the Baltic countries, right? They're all east of the Baltic Sea. If you look way below, okay, it's Poland, which is north of Germany. And then there's a little piece called Kaliningrad, which was sometimes German territory, Prussia, and uh, now is part of Russia. Right above it is Lithuania, above that Latvia, and then Estonia. So these are the Baltic countries. Most Jews lived in Poland. That was the largest Jewish community in the 1930s, before the Holocaust. Uh, in Lithuania, there were about 250,000 Jews before the Holocaust, and they were concentrated mainly in two big cities, but also in small towns and villages. Okay, I guess with this wonderful technology, we need a new battery. <laughs> okay, so you can see Lithuania, and way on the right side, it says Vilnius. Now, Vilnius was the capital of Lithuania for a very long time and is the capital again. Among Jews, it's known as Vilna. Before the Holocaust, like let's say 1939, before the Germans invaded, there were 60,000 Jews in Vilnius. So we're talking about a very big Jewish community. The major publishing houses, schools, and all kinds of institutions, sports clubs, uh, you know, unions, groups to the right and groups to the middle and groups to the left, which is normal, uh, all lived in Vilnius. As a matter of fact, in the 1800s, when Napoleon visited Vilnius, he called it the Jerusalem of Lithuania. That's how Jewish it was. The second largest city, uh, if you can look right to the center, it says Kaunas. Now Kaunas, which is where I was born, or Kovna, had 40,000 Jews before the Holocaust and uh, wasn't as uh, vibrant a city as Vilnius, but still, uh, had, you know, basic schools, synagogues, uh, and various institutions of learning, and uh, was situated between two rivers, which you can clearly see. In order to leave the city of Kaunas, which was almost an island, you had to cross a bridge in going south or going uh, west, and uh, the city of Kaunas had a very vibrant Catholic population and uh, was very friendly to its Jewish neighbors. I don't remember that, but my parents do. My father's best friend, Jonas Stankevich, was a Catholic gentleman who was friends with my dad from the time but it, it was, they were still bachelors. They both worked as salesmen for a big Jewish company in Kaunas, and they would go out into the countryside and sell uh, for that company. And later, when my dad opened his wall paint business, uh, Jonas Stankevich became his foreman and would go out into the country and um, take orders for different paint for 
homes, inside the home, outside the home, and my dad would mix the paint, and uh, Jonas Stankiewicz would go and deliver it. Let's see if it works now. I think I'll stick to old technology. Okay. So uh, if you're looking at where it says Old Town, right, you see a bridge on the left, right? Way over to the left. Okay, w my parents lived just below that bridge, sort of the downtown area of Kaunas. But on the other side of that bridge was a slum area. Uh, could probably hold about 6,000 people. Very dilapidated homes. And when the Nazis conquered Lithuania, first Vilnius and then Kaunas, they set up the ghetto for all of us from the city of Kaunas on the other side of that bridge in that slum area. And all 40,000 Jews of Kaunas had to take whatever they could and go move into that slum area into those homes. So you can imagine it was pretty crowded to have all these people in uh, this tight area. So I will backtrack a little and give you the background of my family, okay? My mother came from a little town near the Baltic Sea and her father was the rabbi but not like a rabbi of nowadays where you know he's got a congregation. His job was to teach little boys in the one room schoolhouse, which was in the back of their little shop that my grandmother ran. She had a shop of textiles. People sewed their own clothing so they would buy fabric and needles and threads and everything they needed for sewing, whether it was for tailoring suits or for sewing dresses, etc. And so in the front, my mother run the store. In the back, my grand, my, say my grandmother, yes, uh, after whom I was named. Uh, she ran the textile store. My grandfather taught the little boys, but in order to bring fabric into her shop, someone had to travel to the big city to buy the fabric for her shop. And that a woman did not do in those days. And so my grandfather would have to go and get the fabric. However, my grandfather was colorblind. So whatever looked good, whether it was red or green or purple, he bought it and that's what my grandmother sold in her store. Unfortunately, one trip, horse and buggy trip to the big city, he was stopped by highway robbers and they took not just his money but his life. And he was only 42 at the time. And two years later, my grandmother died and the family said, that she died of a broken heart, having lost her young husband. And the children were left orphans. Uh, the group was composed of three sisters and a younger brother. The two older sisters, uh, older than my mother, she was the third in line, uh, continued running the store for a while and then decided they didn't want to stay there and uh, one of them uh, met a young man whose family lived in Paris, France, and so she moved to Paris, and then she invited her second sister to come and join her in Paris, and the second sister met a young man there and got married, and so they remained in Paris. My mother was still in Lithuania, and continued going to school. She finished high school and went to a community college where she learned bookkeeping. 
And so after her younger brother left for America, where they had two uncles in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, he moved to Pennsylvania to study medicine, but later moved to Paris where his sisters lived, continued his education at the Sorbonne, which is like the Harvard of Paris, and then uh, in the 30s moved to what was then Palestine and is now Israel. So the only one left in Lithuania was my mother. Uh, they sold that store and she moved to Kaunas, the big city, and became the bookkeeper for this company where my dad worked as a traveling salesman, and that's how they met. So uh, I was born in January of 1940, a little over two years after they were married, and they were considered middle class. They had a nanny for me for a while to take care of me since they were both working, and life was good. They even bought a piano because their baby was going to learn music, of course. But those good times didn't last very long. Uh, I was a year and a half old when the Germans invaded Kaunas. They invaded on June 22nd, and they gave us until August 15th to move to the ghetto. So my mother and father, as well as his parents, those are my, par my grandparents from my dad's side, who are still alive, as well as uh, his older sister with her husband and two little girls, my cousins, uh, as well as a younger brother who had only been married for about three months at the time. So cousins and uncles and aunts, the entire family from my dad's side moved into the ghetto with us. This is a picture of my mother on the left her brother, the one who studied uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Penn State actually, and uh, one of her sisters uh, who lived in Paris. Uh, we have this incredible picture of my dad's family. The little boy way on the right is my dad. He must have been about seven at the time. He's standing next to my grandmother, his mother, and the little girl standing next to the grandmother in the front with the white dress was my dad's younger sister, about a year younger than he. And the girl with the long hair was my father's older sister, the one who was already married and had two girls of her own when they entered the ghetto. So this picture was taken before World War I, before the Jews were exiled from Lithuania by the Russians. But after World War I, they returned to Lithuania. So I've got my grandparents, uncles, aunts, all in this incredible photo, which luckily was saved by the oldest brother, my dad's oldest brother, who had immigrated to Palestine in 1935. And this is the picture. Uh, you have my grandparents on both sides of the photo, okay? My father's older br oldest brother in the center with his new bride as they were going to leave for Palestine in 1935. And on top, on the left top is my dad, the sister that's a year younger than he in the middle, and another younger brother on the top right. The brother on the top right uh, escaped to Siberia with his young wife and baby uh, when the Germans invaded. So he was not in the ghetto, but the baby died of starvation in Siberia. And then you see a young teenager on the bottom of the picture, 
and that is the uncle who had been married three months before we entered the ghetto. A picture of my mom before her engagement. Uh, a lot of the pictures I was able to retrieve from relatives in Pennsylvania and those who immigrated to what was then Palestine. Uh, some relatives in Paris had pictures. Otherwise, I wouldn't have anything. My dad was quite a skater. And you saw from the picture of my mom standing next to water, well, uh, you saw that Kaunas is situated between two rivers. But Lithuania had many streams and many rivers. And it seems like uh, if you weren't a swimmer, then you were a skater. That's my parents at their engagement my parents at their wedding. Didn't she have a gorgeous dress? This is their wedding party. My parents are sitting at the table with my uh, dad's mother and father next to them. Out of this entire group, besides my parents, only three other people survived. Everyone else was killed by the Nazis. This is my aunt's wedding, the one uh, a year younger than my dad. Uh, as you can see on the right side is the older sister with her husband. We can only see one little girl, but there were two. They were all murdered in the ghetto. This is my mother having me in the hospital. I found that at the Holocaust Museum. We'll get to Father Paukstis in a minute. So uh, when we entered the ghetto, uh, everybody was assigned an apartment. And the apartment that we lived in uh, had three floors, uh, the apartment building. And we lived in the bottom floor with several other families. Obviously, uh, buildings were very crowded to have 40,000 people crammed into where only 6,000 could fit. So uh, in the beginning, you could see children in the street playing, uh, you know, uh, women who had babies walking with the carriages in the streets. But uh, very soon, uh, things got really, really bad. This, the ghetto was sealed on the 15th of August, but three days later, uh, the uh, German authorities asked for 500 male volunteers. They said they had very important work for uh, men who knew languages, many languages, especially German and Lithuanian, and could translate important documents for the Germans. It was a very uh, cushy job, it sounded like we better take this kind of opportunity because uh, we might stay alive this way. So immediately 525 men, actually 526, volunteered for the job so they didn't want any more. And they took away those 526 and shot all of them. And the people in the ghetto found out about it within three days because some of the Lithuanian collaborators were seen wearing the suits of these men. Among these 526 was my uncle, the husband of my father's younger sister. Now, she had a baby on June 18th, four days before the German invaded. So she ended up going with her baby from the hospital right to the ghetto. That baby's name was Shoshana, and that was my first cousin. Her dad was shot on August 18th, so Shoshana never knew her father. She was two months old. And what they did at the end of October, 
and then at the end of November again, is they had what they called an action. It was a roundup where everyone in the ghetto had to come to the center of the ghetto and they would have a selection. The Nazi officer in charge would say, you to the right, you to the left. It meant this one could live and this one will go to their death. So by the end of that year, they had already sent 20,000, half the ghetto, to their death. Among them, my grandparents, my father's older sister with her husband and two little girls, because if the old people were selected and a son or, or a daughter hang on to the parents and didn't want to let go, then the Nazi officer said, go ahead, you can go with them. And so that's how my aunt with her husband and two little girls went to their deaths together with my grandparents. In the ghetto, some of the younger men and women decided they're going to have to rebel. So in order to rebel, they need to smuggle guns into the ghetto. Well, whenever people were assigned some kind of a work job outside the ghetto, and that happened often, and you were very pleased when you could get one of those jobs, working at the airport that the Germans were building, or working uh, as a woman in this factory where they were sewing uh, uh, uniforms for the Germans and so on. So uh, <laughs> my youngest uncle, the one who was a newlywed, tried to smuggle in a hand revolver inside a loaf of bread when he came back to the ghetto at the checkpoint where they you know, examined everybody who was coming back at the day's work. Well, they cut the lo Oi. <laughs> they cut the loaf of bread and they found his revolver, his handgun, and they shot him right there on the spot. Uh, so the ghetto, even though we call it a ghetto, was really a death camp. It wasn't like uh, Auschwitz, you know, uh, where they have they had uh, uh, places to you know to burn and uh, sorry I get very emotional about that. So let's leave it at that. Around the city of Kaunas, as you saw, uh, because it looked like an island, uh, during the Middle Ages, fortresses were built to to defend the uh, island of Kaunas against other tribes that might want to attack them. But that worked in the Middle Ages. Now, in the 20th century, a lot of these fortresses were turned into prisons. They were used uh, as prisons previously under the Soviets, then now by the Nazis. And the most notorious of them all was the Ninth Fort. It had a huge killing field next to it, and it was built inside a solid mountain, some of it of rock. And in th that prison, they tortured people until they died or else died of starvation. And all the people that were brought from the ghetto to the Ninth Fort were shot uh, at the Ninth Fort, and that's why uh, that field next to it became a killing field because it was so full of bodies of uh, people from the ghetto that were buried there. So. Uh, My mother heard about a Catholic priest who had a school for priests 
on the other side, on the downtown of Kaunas, the other side of the bridge, and word reached the ghetto, and my mother heard about it, that this father, Pauxtis, said that if children, especially babies, could be smuggled out of the ghetto to him, he will find Christian Lithuanian families willing to take these children. And uh, he even had a very talented student who was able to create fake birth certificates with new names, new Christian names for these children that would be smuggled to him. So first my parents decided it's, we, children should be hidden because they heard that in another ghetto there was a roundup of Nazis with dogs and they went from house to house and they uh, took the children, even though they used an excuse, they said we're taking them to be immunized. Those children were never seen again. And so my mother and father decided it's gonna come to our ghetto as well. Of course, people didn't wanna believe that humans would do that to other human beings, so they would kill children but my parents wanted to make sure. And what they did is first my dad built a fake wall. He put up a wall under that very steep staircase between our first floor and the next floor in our building. And only the people who lived in that building knew that there is a space behind that wall because my dad put some shelves on it and it looked like, you know, that's been there all the time. Uh, people would put, you know, some of their belongings on the shelves, but everybody in our apartment knew that this wall is movable, and that's where I played with my little cousin Shoshana. Now, she was a year and a half younger, and so I called her Lalka, which means doll. I was older, and so she was my little toy. Uh, I played with her hair. She was so cute. She had these cute little black curls, and uh, we would make things out of paper, create you know little hats or boats and take them apart and put them together again, and we spent a lot of time in this little uh, space, which was known as the Malina. Uh, in the ghetto, you had a vernacular that the Jews knew, and the word Malina actually in a Soviet language just means raspberry. But because Yiddish, the language that we spoke, uh, is a Germanic language, uh, Jews didn't want the Germans to understand what they were saying. So if you said, you know, we are, or the kid is in the raspberry, they wouldn't understand, right? So. Uh, those were code words used in the ghetto. And so whenever my mom and dad or Shoshana's mother were assigned jobs, Shoshana and I would play in this Malina. Well, one day Shoshana's mother was on the list that would appear periodically of people who were being sent somewhere else. They were told they were being sent east. Eventually, they were actually sent to concentration camps, to death camps. And Shoshana's mother was sent to a concentration camp. Uh, my mother and father decided we have to get smuggled out as fast as possible before they too will end up on one of those lists and that would be the only way to save our lives if the parents will get killed. So my mother was able to get a job with a women's group. It was called the Women's Brigade. About 10 or 12 women were assigned to a truck or a big wagon with people's belongings, people's suitcases, people's bundles of, you know, things that they owned when they were being taken to the ninth fort for, to their death. 
or they were being sent elsewhere to their death, their belongings were left behind. And so the job of the women's brigade was to go with the truck and all the suitcases and bundles to a warehouse that was set up on the other side of the bridge into downtown Kaunas. So whenever my mother was able to get a job on that, with that women's brigade, she would visit Father Pauk Steets, the head of the uh, seminary for priests. And I'm sure he was very impressed with her. She was very intelligent. She was, you know, had a lot of spunk. She spoke Lithuanian like a farmer because she came from, you know, from that small town in, near the Baltic uh, where everybody around her were farmers around that area. And uh, she, had also, she also knew German because when she went to high school, that was the language of instruction. So uh, Father Paukstis told her, uh, you know, if you can get your child or any child smuggled out, I will find them a home. Well, he did produce a fake birth certificate for me, but my mother wasn't really interested in giving me to Father Paukstis, and then she wouldn't know where I ended up. So that's where my father's old buddy, Jonas Stankevich, came in. Remember, Jonas Stankevich worked for my dad when my dad owned the wall paint business. But of course, when Jews went to the ghetto, they had to give up not just their homes, their apartments, their belongings, but also their businesses. My dad gave his business to Jonas Stankevich, and Jonas Stankevich continued running it, but not just selling uh, paint. He sold whatever he could, and his customers, of course, were uh, some of the German soldiers and also some of the Lithuanian collaborators. So uh, Jonas Stankevich and his wife, Joanna, had two little girls, one a year older than I and one a year younger. And they agreed to take me as their middle child if I could be smuggled out to them. So one day, my mother was able to get a job with the women's brigade and my dad switched jobs with another driver of the truck and so I was sedated I'm sure she must have had a contact with some nurse. Uh, I was heavily sedated, put into a suitcase among all those belongings on the truck. And my dad drove the truck. Of course, at the, before the checkpoint, before the gate, there was always a Lithuanian who would come on board to check papers and poke his bayonet into some of the bundles to make sure no child was being smuggled out. And so my mother bribed uh, this Lithuanian guard with her gold watch and her beloved red leather boots. And he just said, go. And my father drove out the gate. And on the way, he, he was met up by Jonas Stankevich, who took the suitcase and walked away with it to their house. And I must have been really, really, I would say maybe brainwashed, but certainly instructed very well by my mom, because I was three and a half at the time. We're talking about 1943, when I was uh, smuggled to the Stankeviches, that I'm going to call them Mama and Papa that they have two little girls, they're going to be my sisters. Whatever they say, I have to do. Whatever they eat, I have to eat. And not tell anybody who I really am. I'm going to be a Stankevich child. And uh, it's only temporary. My mother made me understand that it's like pretending, playing a role, but only for a while. The war will be over, and they're going to come for me. And I should promise, 
She made me promise that I will not tell, I'll keep it a secret. And in return, she promised that if she could, she'll visit. Whenever she could, she will come and uh, say hello to me somehow. And she kept her promise. Because uh, one night, I dreamt that my mother was kissing me. And it turned out that she had actually been there. But the craziest one was a Christmas party at the Stankevich household. Santa Claus appeared, brought me my stuffed bulldog, my favorite toy that had been left behind in the ghetto. But when I looked down at Santa's feet, Santa was wearing my mother's shoes. And you can imagine that I almost <gasps> blurted out something, and Mrs. Stankevich quickly put her hand over my mouth so I don't <laughs> give it away. Uh, but uh, my mother really was crazy in a way. As a matter of fact, she got the nickname of Gita. Her name was Gita. Gita the Meshuganet means Gita the crazy one because she was telling people that the Germans are going to kill children and people in the ghetto didn't want to believe her. Some people thought maybe she's right and they did give her their children to smuggle out the same way that she smuggled me out, except that she needed to take them to Father Paukstis. As a matter of fact, she had to take Shoshana to Father Paukstis because the Stankevich family uh, didn't want to take another child. They took me, obviously, but did not want to take Shoshana. So she was taken to Father Paukstis, who uh, passed her on to nuns. The nuns found a farm that raised pigs, and uh, that's where Shoshana ended up. So this is a picture of me and Shoshana in the ghetto. Do you notice that we're wearing these pins with Jewish stars on them? Now, the adults had to wear the yellow patch with a Jewish star, front and back of their clothing. Of course, since we were mostly in that Molina, in that little hiding space. Uh, we were wearing these as ornaments. We didn't even know what they were. But this is just before I was smuggled out and Shoshana after me. And so that's the only picture we have from that period. Shoshana's mother had this picture, teeny, teeny version of it uh, in her dress when she went to a uh, Stutthof concentration camp. Here I am with my favorite toy, my bulldog, and this picture the Stankeviches had. You can see, right, this, the way I'm looking here and the way I'm looking here, right, that it was taken the same time, and that picture 50 years later, when I decided that I need to go back to Lithuania to find my rescuer, my righteous family, the picture that she had proved that she is Mrs. Stankiewicz, because obviously I didn't recognize her. Uh, the name Stankiewicz, or Yona Stankiewicz, is like looking for a John Smith. So even though the Jewish community in Kaunas tried to find her, they weren't able to. But uh, eventually they did. This is a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Stankiewicz when they were married. And that's me on the left with my Stankiewicz sister. Don't we look like we're sisters? You know, the round faces, the pug noses. Uh, Obviously, that helped that I looked like I belonged in their family. Uh, one of the stories that was told about me is that Mrs. Tankevich had a cousin, a young cousin, a teenager, who became pregnant, and I was the teenager's illegitimate child. And that's why the Stankeviches are raising me. It was one good story. Here's Mrs. Stankiewicz with the 
her biological two daughters. Unfortunately, the older one died at age 16 in a gas accident in their kitchen, so I was never able to see her. This is the ghetto in 1944. Every house was burned. Out of the 40,000 that entered the ghetto, less than 2,000 survived. The gentleman with the gray jacket and the Jewish star and the cap, that's my dad. I mean, he was barely 40, but he looked like an old man. And you can see two brothers finding that they both survived. Behind them, you can see chimneys because any house uh, that was made of wood was burned in the ghetto, and the only thing left standing were the chimneys. But we all went back to see who is still alive and what is still left of the ghetto. So uh, after my parents uh, uh, survived, and not in the ghetto, but hiding in various places, but that's a long story. Uh, in any case, they both survived, which is miraculous that I had both my mom and dad survive and come back and find me. Uh, it took a while for them to find me because the Russians who uh, liberated, in quotation marks, Lithuania, right, and the Germans escaped, uh, the Russians were arresting anybody who was a capitalist during the German period and anybody who made, who did business with the Germans. So, of course, uh, Jonas Stankiewicz, who had run my father's old business and did you know business with the Germans, he would have been arrested. So Mr. and Mrs. Stankiewicz with their two daughters and myself escaped to a farm in northern, northern Lithuania where Mrs. Stankiewicz originally grew up near the Latvian border. But after a few weeks, uh, my parents did find me and eventually Mr. Stankiewicz was arrested by the Russians. And he was given 20 years, a punishment of 20 years of hard labor in Siberia. But my parents interceded on his behalf, so then the judge cut his punishment to 10 years of hard labor in Siberia. But it turns out that uh, the Stankiewicz's were in Siberia less than four years and then went back to Lithuania. So after they found me, my parents decided they have to look for Shoshana. They knew that her dad was shot right in the beginning of the ghetto, right? And then they also knew that her mother had been sent to a concentration camp, and when the war was over, she didn't return. So they were sure she also had died and they weren't gonna leave her there. So they tracked her down on that pig farm. Now, she wasn't taken as, as good care of as I was. I, with the Stankiewiczs, uh, ate what they ate and played with my sisters and uh, they treated me really nicely. But the farmers that had Shoshana did not treat her very nicely. She was hardly ever bathed. Uh, she had to take care of the pigs. And so uh, she had wounds all over her head that it took a while for my mom to treat. Uh, and then uh, my parents decided to adopt her. Uh, and I say adopt in quotation marks because we were just going to be a family of four uh, and run away from Lithuania because my parents decided that the liberating Soviets are not going to be so nice and they were smart because Jews who remained under the Soviets were stuck under the Soviets. You know, Stalin wasn't such a savior. So uh, in order to go 
to where the Allies had set up refugee camps. Anybody know where the Allies set up refugee camps for us survivors of the Holocaust? No? It was Germany and Austria, okay? Mostly the Americans set up refugee camps in Germany, in, in the conquered Germany, and the uh, British uh, set up many camps in Austria. So my parents decided they wanted to get to Germany to one of those refugee camps, uh, which the Americans called displaced persons camp fancier than refugees, right? So we were DPs. But in order to get to Germany, you have to travel through Poland. So my father bought a passport from a woman whose Polish husband uh, was killed during the war. And in this passport, he placed a photo of us as a family of four. And you're looking at the picture from this fake passport that we are Poles returning to Poland. Uh, the stamp uh, over Shoshana's face and jacket says Polska, which is Poland. I have to tell you that trip through Poland was a nightmare, which I still remember to this day because at every stop on that train ride, uh, some soldier would come on board with the vicious looking dogs to check documents. The trip took three or four days and Shoshana and I, as well as my mother, had to pretend we're mute because the only one who spoke Polish was my dad. So since we're a Polish family, our we just had to keep our mouths shut. My dad brought that up when I was a teenager years later. He said, when you were five years old, you knew how to keep your mouth shut. So uh, <laughs> don't mouth off to your parents. Here we are finally in Germany. And believe it or not, this picture was taken for the New York Times. Uh, Somebody, I guess, from the United States came to our displaced persons camp in Germany and wanted a picture of survivors. So that's my dad, myself, and Shoshana in front of a monument that was erected there in memory of those who perished. And uh, we're both wearing the same clothes and the same bows. And we were sisters for quite a while. Uh, first, we ended up in this children's center. On top, it says Salzheim. Salzheim it was a suburb of Frankfurt. Frankfurt is a big city in Germany. But Salzheim had a military camp, a German military camp. And so what the American army did is took over that military camp and put refugees into the different barracks, and when they ran out of space in the military barracks, the latecomers, which was us, were put into German homes together with German families. Many were actually just the women and their kids, because the husbands had been soldiers. So we ended up uh, with uh, a family of a woman and her son. Son was about my age. And uh, my mother, who spoke German, became good friends with the Hausfrau, the lady of the house. And they worked out schedules when we would cook and eat and when they would cook and eat. And of course, I played with the boy and with other kids in the uh, town, as children tend to do and uh, learn the language, of course. So fortunately, I didn't have to stay at that children's center too long, well, Shoshana and I. Uh, what I do remember is that in order to fatten us up, they gave us these high-calorie foods, 
and they also gave us a mug with hot milk every morning. And within about a minute, this real yucky skin would form on top of the hot milk. Really gross. Even the piece of chocolate that they gave us didn't make it more palatable, and I don't like milk to this day. What I do remember that was really nice is uh, one day in the bedroom where beds were lined up on both sides of this long room where a bunch of us little girls of different ages uh, slept. Uh, one morning, a woman brought out a tray and on it was a birthday cake, and it turned out to be for me. I had turned six, and so that was the first time I actually had a birthday, and it was, you know, quite memorable. Nowadays, birthdays are not that important, but they, it was sure exciting when I turned six. But after that, my parents took Shoshana and me to their home so we didn't have to be in the children's center anymore. So that was neat. And also, I started school, because I was six, I started first grade, and Shoshana started kindergarten. Uh, here we are with a bunch of other kids. My dad is the gentleman in the back. Shoshana and I are in the front. And a little girl, who I still remember, her name was Sarah. She was an orphan, and she just hung on to Shoshana and me, wherever we went, she wanted to be our sister, too. Uh, I found this at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. A little girl in the back lighting the Sabbath candles is me. So this was set up by the Americans, a Jewish school for us. And obviously, we got to celebrate Sabbath and Jewish holidays. Uh, luckily, I was able to find several pictures uh, at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, this one is my mom and Shoshana. Here, Shoshana and I are wearing the suits. As you can see, they, we call them training, uh, training suits. They came in care packages from America, and it still exists. Uh, you know, when people in America contribute uh, some of their used clothing or even some food items, and it gets sent to refugees. Uh, this is what we would get. Uh, and we would go through a package of clothing and see what we could wear or what needed to be unraveled and re-knit or re-sewn for us. The two things that I still remember that I loved, Hershey chocolate bar and Lipton chicken noodle soup. Okay, one more thing that I did like is Spam. I don't eat that anymore. <laughs> well, in 1947, while we were in Germany, my sister was born, my biological sister. Her name is Lily, and she cried for nine months. She screamed. I just really didn't like her for the first nine months, but then she was okay. <laughs> so here I am with my little sister, Lily, and this is in Germany, next to the house where we lived. Uh, this gentleman came to visit us in Germany at the DP camp. Okay, anybody know who, it, who that might be? With the white hair, see the gentleman with the white hair? I'll give you a hint. He became the first prime minister of Israel, and the Israeli airport is named after him. Nobody? His name was David Ben-Gurion. Okay, David Ben-Gurion uh, was the first prime minister of Israel. He came to our DP camp, and he talked to us about uh, going to Palestine, nowhere else. Not like we could go very many countries. Do you know what they were saying in the US Congress at the time and why we were there for so many years? Who wants these Eastern European refugees here? 
They're going to come and take away our jobs. Sound familiar? Just a little political statement on my part. Okay? So there was uh, a number of people that they did allow into the United States, uh, especially if they were seamstresses or tailors, because uh, you could start with, uh, buying clothing now in department stores instead of having to sew them at home. So uh, tailors and seamstresses were quite in demand, also electricians or uh, other uh, uh, plumbers maybe. Of course, if you had a lot of money, you're welcome in America, but who had a lot of money? I mean, you know, we were lucky if we had the clothes on our backs. So uh, Ben-Gurion talked about establishing a state of Israel, which, as you know, happened that year. And the lady sitting way on the left, you know, with the white jacket or scarf, that's my mom. She was on that committee. Can you see? A woman way over to the left. Okay. So there was a state of Israel, uh, and that's my dad with a black beret, and uh, we have a car, a convertible, in Germany at the DP camp. Okay, I'm standing in the center of the car. My aunt, Shoshana's mother, had just come to and found us through an organization called HIAS, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. This organization still exists. As a matter of fact, right here in Massachusetts, there are several offices of HIAS, except that they are now helping refugees from other countries, uh, not Jewish refugees, even though it's called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And so uh, through Hayas, my aunt who survived a uh, concentration camp was able to find us, except Shoshana didn't recognize her mother and didn't want to go to her mother. She said, I don't know you. And I said, Shoshana, I remember her because I'm older, I remember. <laughs> I didn't really. But uh, Shoshana had to go with her mother, and her mother came with a new husband. And so my sister was born in March, and Shoshana's brother was born uh, mid-April. So there's Shoshana's mother holding the little baby boy uh, who turned out to be Shoshana's brother. You're probably wondering, how did we get a convertible in Germany? Well, my dad was very clever. I think by now you must have figured out that my mom and dad were very clever. Uh, he bought cigarettes from the American soldiers, and then he and usually would take me along to soccer games out in the country. We, he loved soccer. And at the soccer games, he would sell the American cigarettes that he bought from the American soldiers in our camp. He would sell them to the Germans out in the country at a profit. And with the money that he made from selling those cigarettes, he was able to buy a car, a convertible. Isn't that clever? And then before we even left Germany, he opened a store where he sold refrigerators and stoves and uh, dishes, silverware, things that people need if they move to United States or Canada. South Africa was very popular. A lot of Lithuanian Jewish survivors went to Johannesburg. And um, some of us were going to Israel, Shoshana, and her family went first, 1948, and then we followed in 1949. This picture from the Holocaust Museum, uh, see the girl in the very front with the long braids leading the parade? That's me. 
uh, what they were telling me at the Holocaust Museum is that uh, a lot of pictures were taken from our DP camp in Germany, and that is a celebration that there is a state of Israel. And, uh, it, you know, it just said these children are marching to celebrate Israel, but I recognize myself, obviously. Uh, in this picture is already my s sister on the left. She's probably around three, and that was before we immigrated to Israel. So, jumping forward, uh, f we lived in Israel three and a half years. I started fourth grade when I got there. Uh, we were in classes like 40, 50 kids per class because we were immigrants from all over the world. Some of the kids in my class came from Morocco and in Algier and Iraq. Some came from Poland, from Germany, from Austria. Uh, half the class maybe knew Hebrew because they were born there. And the rest of us spoke all kinds of languages. Uh, Eastern European kids could communicate in Yiddish, even if we spoke with different dialects of Yiddish. But, of course, we were all very anxious to learn Hebrew, and I put down roots very quickly. Uh, for about two or three months uh, being in Israel, the teacher sent a note for my mother that my mother should come to school, and the teacher said, uh, I believe that there's something wrong with your daughter's hearing. You should have her hearing examined. I haven't heard her open her mouth in three months. And my mother said, nothing wrong with her hearing. She'll talk when she's ready. And sure enough, three months after that, according to my mother, I'm not sure that's true, that the teacher sent for her and said, shut her up, maybe. <laughs> But I certainly picked up Hebrew. I put down very deep roots, and uh, I eventually became a Hebrew teacher. But unfortunately, we only lived in Israel for three and a half years because my mother became very sick in Israel. The tropical climate apparently was killing her, and the only antibiotic at the time was penicillin, and she was allergic to penicillin. So she was so bedridden that she was just losing weight, and this professor at the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem said, you're going to die if you continue living here. You have to go to a cold climate. And so they had a relative in Montreal, Canada. Talk about cold. That relative sponsored us, and we immigrated to Montreal and my mother became well because she did very well in the cold climate, so I guess he was right. I didn't like it because I had to start all over again. I was 13 and a half years old when we arrived in Montreal. I had to learn English, I had to learn French, I had to make new friends, and you know how tough it is at that age, right? Even if you speak the language, uh, I still remember my English teacher made every single kid stand up and read Shakespeare out loud. And you can imagine how everybody in class would crack up every time I opened my mouth and it said this and that and, you know, had a very, very heavy accent. Now I only have an accent in the evening when I'm tired. Right? Say yes. So, uh, you understand me, don't you? Okay, that's the main thing. So uh, I had to start all over again. It wasn't pleasant, but I did it. I did make it through the four years of high school. I did make it through college. But I, during high school, I went to a Hebrew high school, and the print, well, the teacher in my high school, one of the teachers, became the principal of the United Jewish Teachers Seminary. And he came to my parents and he said, I want her, I'm giving her a full scholarship, want her to be a teacher. And I said, no way. 
I'm not going to stand up in front of kids who are going to make fun of my accent. I don't want to be a teacher. I want to be a chemist, work in the lab with test tubes and Bunsen burners who can't talk back at me. But my parents prevailed, and they sent me to the seminary, and I did become a teacher. I think it was a good choice because, actually, I have enjoyed all those years that I have taught and really loved teaching and loved the relationship I created with hundreds of kids over the years. Just a little aside. Okay, so 50 years later, I am living in Burlington, Vermont, okay? Uh, I have taught Hebrew school. I went for my master's at the University of Vermont in Burlington and became an instructor of Hebrew and Yiddish at UVM, right? University of Vermont in Burlington. And I'm saying I have to go back to Lithuania. I want to see if I can find my rescuers. Well, easier said than done, right? I applied to the State Department for a permit to go to Lithuania, and I got a three-page letter saying, well, since you were born in Lithuania, and Lithuania is part of the Soviet Union, then you are a subject of the Soviet Union. And as soon as you arrive in Lithuania, you're going to be arrested because you teach Hebrew. And Hebrew is not kosher as far as the Soviets are concerned. And we will not be able to help you because even though you're an American citizen, your passport says born in Lithuania. So uh, my family said, are you crazy? You're not going. Well, in 1992, Lithuania was the first country to declare its independence from the Soviet Union. So I started, hmm, maybe now's the time. But unfortunately, my mom became really ill and she passed away in 93, so the trip was postponed. And finally, in the spring of 1995, I said, yes, soon as the semester was over, I'm going to Lithuania. At that time, my daughter, Judith, my middle daughter, who is now a professor at Union College, by the way, uh, she and her boyfriend at the time, now her husband, were in Latvia, in Riga, Latvia, the next country north of Lithuania. So I flew into Riga, and we took a bus, all three of us, into Lithuania. So what you're looking at is the border. Okay, obviously the bus had to stop over there, and a Lithuanian soldier or guard came on board the bus to check our papers. If you've ever had a real terrible stomach ache, you know, like maybe before a test or something, that's how I felt. Seeing the Lithuanian flag, seeing this uh, guard with the kind of clothing that I hadn't seen in 50 years, it was really scary. My stomach was doing a lot of somersaults. Even though I was holding an American passport, you know, I worried that he would say something, make me get off the bus because it says born in Lithuania. But finally, everybody's papers were checked and we were on our way. What a sigh of relief. And I had my camera ready to take pictures of what I will see. And the first thing I saw was an old windmill. And just before I saw it, I said to my daughter, Judy, there's going to be a windmill. She said, why? I said, I don't know, but there's going to be a windmill. And sure enough, there it was. You can see it hadn't been used in years. 
But this is northern Lithuania, close to the Latvian border. And that's obviously where Mrs. Stankevich family came from, where we would go, the Stankeviches, when I was part of their family, we would go every couple of weeks to get more food. I would run around with the children, chase the geese and the ducks and so on, and we would get enough food because it was wartime uh, to bring it back to the city of Kaunas. And there were so many windmills in that area because there's so much water. But obviously, this hasn't been used in years. But I did manage to click uh, and get a picture. The other thing that we saw is many houses painted yellow because there wasn't a sale on yellow paint, but because it's so dreary, it's always gray and rainy and overcast. And so people paint their houses yellow or orange to brighten it up, to make it more sunny looking. Uh, in the city of Vilnius, uh, there is only one synagogue out of the 90 or so uh, that stood there. And there's a beautiful cathedral, but in the back is a sculpture of Moses carrying the Ten Commandments. And crazy, can you see the horns on Moses' head? Right? That's because of a mistranslation. The mistranslation was from the Hebrew to the Greek. The first translation of the Holy Bible, the Jewish Bible, into Greek. And the word for raise, because the Hebrew text says that when Moses came down Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, his head shone in rays of light. Well, the Hebrew word for array is keren, and the word for horn is keren. So when it was translated into the Greek, instead of saying that his head shone with rays of light, it was translated, his head shone with horns of light. And so, of course, when you make a sculpture, you don't create rays of light, you create horns of light, and just a great excuse for anti-Semites to say Jews are not the same as other humans. Jews have horns. And that has continued throughout the centuries. Uh, in one of the little museums, they have a few remnants from synagogues that used to exist in Vilnius and were all burned. Uh, there was a restaurant where I met the only mem Jewish member of the Lithuanian parliament. And it turns out that his mother was a survivor from the Kaunas ghetto. He gave me her phone number. I spoke to her in Yiddish. And when I told her my parents' names, she said, oh, I remember you, mother. Gita the Meshugane, Gita the crazy one, the one who said that they're going to kill the children. She wasn't crazy, she was so right, because so many of us who didn't believe her lost their children, because there was a roundup in the Kovna ghetto, but luckily Shoshana and I were no longer there. Uh, at the cemetery in Vilnius, I found uh, the burial place of my uncle, the one who had escaped to Siberia, but his baby died of starvation. And some areas that were once Jewish businesses, uh, the area where the Jews of Vilna were all taken and buried in mass graves. Very depressing. I also went to the little town near the Baltic where my mother came from, the town of Shilala. And on the way, we saw this sign and it says, Jido Genocido. No, I don't know Lithuanian anymore. And I do speak so many other languages, but Lithuanian was completely erased because my parents refused to speak it after we left Lithuania. And so what this says is Jewish genocide. And the arrow pointed into the woods, and sure enough, they had taken everybody in the town 150 men, women, and children, killed them in one mass grave, 
and buried them in the woods. And the town itself, where my mother came from, this little village, was exactly like she described it. The church was there. Houses, they looked like out of a movie set. I mean, it's unimaginable. It still looks like that, but that's how the pe people over there live. This is the mass grave with uh, the sign that was put up later by the Jewish community. My daughter standing next to it just says, that all the Jews uh, were buried here in one mass grave. In the field where there was a Jewish uh, burial, which I thought I would find my mother's parents, right? Because they died when she was still a teenager. This was before the Holocaust. Every stone was gone except for one. So obviously, uh, I did not find my grandparents' graves and uh, found out that the people in that village just removed the stones and used it to pave their own driveways or whatever. And uh, the year after, when I went back again, that one stone was lying flat on its side. So count us, the city where I was born first. Of course, you have to cross the water and then you can celebrate. Here is Mrs. Tankevich with the white hair. I'm sitting next to her in the middle, and the lady uh, next to us is the secretary of the Jewish community who found her for me. Didn't find her in 95, but did find her in 96, and that's why I went back. And so we had to have a translator but it was so nice to see her and to be with her. Uh, she lived near an old Jewish uh, cemetery, but with her, I went to the Catholic cemetery because I wanted to pay my respects to Mr. Paukstis, uh, Mr. Stankiewicz, I'm sorry, Paukstis was the priest. Mr. Stankiewicz, her husband, had died 11 years earlier, so I never did get to see him. And as I told you, her oldest daughter died at age 16. So I went with her to their cemetery and I planted flowers on the family plot. She lived with her granddaughter and great-grandson. And uh, she uh, made sure that somebody would go with me to the archives and help me find documents, which I did find my actual birth certificate in the archives. And the lady that took me also showed me places where Jews had lived. Like this was once the Jewish hospital. I wouldn't have known if I hadn't been with a proper guide. But a most disturbing thing, swastikas, somebody trying to write Hitler. And I said to the, my guide, Miriam, the writing's on the wall, anti-Semitism, is rearing its head, and Miriam said, oh, it's teenagers. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. I mean, this is wrong, right? This is wrong against any religion, any skin color. People find a scapegoat, not just bullying in school, when you hear somebody being called a name, don't be a bystander. The people that I'm most angry with in Lithuania is that they did this to their Jewish neighbors, that they looked the other way and they allowed the evil to happen. They could have stopped it from happening. And it's up to each one of us in our own way to be active for good. Uh, this cathedral at the top of the main boulevard in Kaunas uh, brought back memories because I had, you know, really erased not just the language but every. Right. I had prayed in this cathedral every Sunday with my. Lithuanian family, so that was very exciting to see that, and it brought back wonderful memories of Mr. and Mrs. Dankevich and how 
they treated me so well. So when I went to Israel to the Holocaust Museum, I made sure that their memory is going to go fast. This is at the Ninth Fort, the killing field. My parents are buried in Montreal, and that's my sister, now an adult. And on the bottom of their monument, it says, whoever saves one soul saves an entire world. That's a Jewish tradition, and I feel that my mother and father saved many souls, so they saved an entire world. And that, those are my parents at their 50th wedding anniversary. And here I am at the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, where the different communities have stones with the names of the community. I'm standing under the city of Kaunas. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.